The Capital by Robert Manasse. It starts with a pig racing through Brussels, the administrative seat of the European Union, where the destiny of an entire continent is negotiated. Austrian writer Robert Manasse spent four years there researching for his book. His epic, The Capital, revises some clichés and proves that Eurocrats can be great characters for a novel. I felt a lot of respect. But at the same time, it pained me to see that everything people create is full of pitfalls, full of senseless contradictions, full of vanity, competition and vindictiveness. In the novel, a daring project aims to polish the tarnished image of the European Commission. But caught between national interests and intrigues, it's doomed to failure. A failure symptomatic of the EU in the greatest crisis in its history. Robert Manasse paints a picture full of atmosphere. A tragic comedy with serious undertones. I keep hoping that before absolute insanity breaks out again, before European civilization is destroyed again, before everything is reduced to smoking rubble again, people will say, no, not this time. Satire, detective story, analysis. The first novel about the EU is also a plea for a Europe that transcends national egoisms. Marion Poshman, The Pine Islands. It might have been easy to roll out the clichés. Japan, land of kimonos and cherry blossoms. Marion Poshman didn't do that. She lived there for some time, and in her novel, The Pine Islands, worlds collide. She sends a coffee-drinking man who researches beards to Japan, a country with few beards and too much tea. In literature, rejection can make things appear more plastic and material. If things are disturbing or in the way, that makes them much more present than if you see them with infatuated eyes. Her character Gilbert Sylvester is not really a fan of Japan. He thinks his wife is cheating on him and he just wants to get away. A world-weary Japanese man becomes his companion. Together they follow a Japanese poet's footsteps through the country in search of the most beautiful spot for committing suicide. The book is macabre and full of humor. They don't feel comfortable in their skin and want to break out and change. They're trying to escape their old lives. And suspended over all of it is this mysterious spirit of the pines, and it isn't clear whether that's a plant or a ghost. Marion Poschmann has written a delicate, intricate novel that dissolves boundaries and blurs levels of reality. What begins as a journey toward death becomes a poetic affirmation of life. Thomas Lear, Sleeping Sun. This book focuses on our star. Like the Earth, Lear's novel revolves around the sun. Starting on a summer day in 2011, this wide-ranging work takes in the present and the past, deep into the last century. Its principle is what the author calls a spiral sun. The key to this book is that from this center in the year 2011, rolling up the timeline in a spiral, you soon find yourself in different decades. This spiral contains narrative processes that remind me of the image of a sun. On a day in August, artist Milena Zontag opens a major retrospective exhibition in Berlin. Thomas Lehr uses pictures from this exhibition to unfold a panorama of society, characters and relationships. He interweaves the great upheavals of the 20th century, the outbreak of war, communist East Germany, the fall of the Berlin Wall, with his characters' marital crises and sexual relationships. All the 
liegen im weißen Glanz der Sonne begraben, alle Zeiten vielleicht auch im gewaltigen Schneewirbel einer weißen Geschichte, die wir ängstlich im Prisma unserer Köpfe in einzelne Epochen zerlegen, in Jahrzehnte, Monate, Tagen, Stunden, Schnitt. Time, History. This is a book that challenges the reader. I see my novel as a big adventure vacation, and I think the effort it costs is the effort you experience on a beautiful hike in the mountains. Thomas Lear plans two more parts to form a trilogy, so the voyage of discovery is far from over. Franz Orbel, The Raft of the Medusa. It's a horrifying tale. 150 shipwrecked sailors put together a makeshift raft in their attempt to survive. Initially, they work together, but they soon turn on each other. It's a real-life tragedy that happened in 1816 and still reverberates today. When I heard about this story, I was awestruck. It shows human beings in an extreme situation. This group of 150 people is completely enclosed. They have no external input. Austrian writer Franz Orbel has been meticulous in his study of the sources surrounding the disaster. His work depicts the brutal fight for survival. Only 15 people lived through it. Within days, they had shed every last vestige of the moral values they otherwise lived by. Wer hätte gedacht, dass 50 Stunden reichen würden, um Menschen in Kannibalen zu verwandeln? Kolonisten, die den Wilden die europäischen Werte vermitteln sollten, hatten sich in Menschenfresser verwandelt. The dramatic scenes playing out on the Mediterranean 200 years later were very much on Franz Obel's mind as he was writing. But the novel focuses only on the historical event. I was probably trying to process the migration crisis through my work, but I realized it was too immediate. When I stumbled on this story, I realized it was related. This historical event suddenly seemed very topical. The Raft of the Medusa confronts the reader with disturbing truths showing how quickly humans can lose their moral compass when it comes to saving their own skin. Sasha Mariana Salzmann, Beside Yourself. How does it feel to be beside yourself when the person you are falls apart and nothing is certain anymore, constantly roaming and never feeling at home? In her debut novel, Sasha Mariana Salzmann tells of a Jewish woman, Ali, and her search for her missing twin brother, Anton. My name hangs with the first letter of the alphabet and it is a cry, a stop, a fall, a promise on a B and a C that it cannot be given in the causalityslosigkeit of the story. A thing that many believe that the same station is going to be seen as a common somewhere. Her family history has been a catalogue of rifts, restarts and moves between Moscow, Berlin and Istanbul. Ali and Anton's insecurity and instability are only partly a result of their migration from Russia to Germany. It's more than not knowing where they come from. I don't mean a country, I mean their story. And so more or less voluntarily they begin to search for that themselves. Step by step, Ali gathers together the fragments of the past without putting them together to make a whole. Istanbul becomes a place of transition for her. Ali, the young woman, becomes Ali, the young man. Istanbul was also where Zasha Mariana Salzmann wrote her novel. The city is very special to her. I move a lot between countries and continents. Istanbul was the first place where I felt at one with myself. It's like your first big love. You don't forget it. An intense, melancholy novel, restless and relentless. Sasha Mariana Salzmann writes of endless roaming and the courage to reinvent yourself. Gerhard Falkner, Romeo or Juliet. It all begins with a meeting of writers in an anonymous hotel. All quite predictable, you'd think. Routine, even boring. 
But this man turns it into a literary game of hide and seek. Gerhard Falkner and his Romeo or Juliet. It's not a rhetorical or in the middle, like cheese or meat, clouds or wind. It's an existential or existentialist or. In the story itself, there are only traces left, traces of, I wouldn't call it love, but more a betrayed passion. A betrayed passion with repercussions. Writer Kurt Prinzhorn finds strange things happening in his life. Items suddenly start disappearing from his hotel room. Was it a former lover? If so, which one? His self-assured arrogance begins to crumble. He's plagued by doubts. So much is misleading. I think it's not bad to smile every now and then. It doesn't make the book any less serious when a little irony crops up here and there. The story is interlaced with allusions to film classics and literary quotes, all on the subjects of desire and betrayal. I think education or knowledge is not something one needs to apologize for, and I have no desire or interest in hiding it. I'm more bothered by people being overly modest. It's easy to get lost in this intellectual maze, in such a way that you no longer want to get out. <laughs>